Well, I shared a few of these downstairs uh, this morning with the Sunday School group, and I thought I'd share a few more with you folks up here. It's Valentine's Day, and uh, what an exciting time. Amen? <laughs> right. Isn't it something? I know it. I, I, whoever created this wonderful day, uh, yes, it worked for somebody who sold something. So, All right, here we go. Um, after a quor- uh, uh, an argument, a wife said to her husband, you know, I was a fool when I married you. The husband replied, yes, dear, but I was in love and did not notice. <laughs> come on, that'll come to you. All right. Any married man should forget his mistakes. There's no use in two people remembering the same thing. <laughs> oh, come on now. All right. A little boy asked his father, Daddy, how much does it cost to get married? The father replied, I don't know, son. I'm still paying. (laughs) Now that one made me, I'm sorry. That's that's a good one. Uh, All right, here we go. Um, The husband sat in the living room with his hand on the television knob. Hey, Beverly, he shouted to his wife in the kitchen. Is there anything you want to say before football season starts? With some cooks, the call is come and get it. With her, it's try and eat it. (laughs) All right, in our marriage, we've decided never to go to bed angry. We've gone without sleep now for 22 days. (laughs) All right, somebody approached the grieving widow at a funeral and said, I'm sorry, my dear, please tell me what were your husband's last words. She looked at him and sweetly said, you don't scare me with that shotgun, Martha. You couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. (laughs) The lady told her neighbor, my husband is a do-it-yourself man. Whenever I ask him to do anything, he says, do it yourself. (laughs) Uh, The pastor happily told his congregation about the church's new public address system. He explained that the microphone and wiring were paid for with with the church funds. Then he added, the loudspeaker in the front has been donated by a member of our congregation in loving memory of his wife. Come on now. All right, here we go. People ask us the secret of our long marriage. It's really quite simple. Two evenings a week, we take time to go out to a restaurant, a quiet dinner, soft music, some candlelight, and a slow walk home. She goes on Tuesdays, and I go Fridays. (laughs) All right. There you go. And so praise the Lord. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. And ah, oh, goodness, no, in, in, I, I'm, I am happily married, 22 and a half years, and God's been very gracious to me. I'm very thankful for my wife. She has put up with me that long, and she loves me, and I'm so thankful for that, and I love her. And if God's given you a good spouse, you be thankful for that, and you rejoice in what the Lord's blessed you with. And I'd encourage you, uh, make your marriage everything that God would have it to be, and uh, you'll not regret that. First chapter, I'm sorry, First John chapter 4. Could, could you stand with me in reverence to the Word of God, please? First John chapter Chapter 4. We're going to read just four or five verses here, and we'll jump into the message today. And uh, the Bible says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And if you will, look at verse 19 with me. Verse 19 of 1 John chapter 4, it says, We love him because he first loved us. Let's pray. Father, I come to you this morning, and Lord, you know I need your help. Lord, I'm not worthy, Father, in my flesh to stand behind this pulpit, but Father, in Christ I am, and I'm so thankful that today I know that, Father, I have a home in heaven. I have a a heavenly Father. I have a Savior. And, Father, it's because I I came to you as a sinner, lost and undone, without hope, and I accepted Jesus Christ as as the propitiation for my sins. He he paid it all on Calvary, and I just put my faith in him. And, Lord, from that day till this, you've, you, you, (laughs) Lord, you've been faithful. You've You've kept me and made me a child of God, and I'm so thankful that today I have Christ as Savior. Father, I would pray that today, if there's anyone in here that's without the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that today would be their very day of salvation. And Father, for every single person in this room who claims Christ as Savior, Father, today would you help us to listen, Lord, to be attentive to your Spirit. I would pray that, Father, you'd draw us closer to you 
And that, Father, our lives, we desire to be more like your Son, to resemble him and to represent him here on this earth. I ask this and pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to jump right in this morning, and um, I, hope, I hope what I'm going to give you this morning will be a help. I really believe it will. Um, it's something I've, I've been praying about and thinking about for the last couple of months, and the timing just kind of worked out. It really did as far as this being Valentine's Day, but a beautiful passage of Scripture in 1 John chapter 4 is, is really written, and it's talking about the love of God. And it's an incredible thing, but it's talking about the love of God and how we are to reflect it and, how, and its relationship to others as far as our lives is concerned. And I just want to give you some thoughts this morning, and again, I really hope they'll be a help to you. We have three words uh, in, in the Greek, and there, there's actually a fourth word that can be translated love, but primarily three words in Greek that are translated love. The first one is agape, and that, that's, a, that's a, a love that is used almost predominantly for the love of God. It's, it's something that is used time and again in 1 John in chapter 4 here, and you'll see it used throughout the New Testament for that, that love. And it's, a, it's a, a benevolent love, it's a charitable love, it's a love that is sacrificial, that is giving, it's a love love that's deep and it's abiding, it's eternal. Um, and, and also in the Greek, there's a word phileo, uh, and, and you'll, uh, it, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, all right? It, it, we get at the translation there, uh, but it's phileo means affection, it's a friendship type of love, uh, generally speaking. And then you also have a third type, it's not used in the New Testament, but it's the word eros, and the word eros is a, is a word for uh, 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 that which is a lustful or longing, um, it's the word, uh, we get the word uh, erotic from it in the English, and so just kind of understand uh, a little bit of the basic basis um, of, of where the, the, the word love in our, in our English language comes from as far as the Greek. Um, this morning, I want to give you some thoughts, and I want, you to, I want you to consider these, and I want to start out by saying number one this morning, that, that real love is defined by God's truth. Real love is defined by God's truth. And, and I'm going to say some things, and I, I think there's some things I'm going to say in the next moment that, that if you're not paying attention, you can take them wrong. Our, our culture has really warped what love is. They really have. They've been so effective. Um, quite frankly, when you look at, at the three words, you have agape, uh, you have a phileo, and you have eros. And, and in their proper place, those are not wrong, okay? There's nothing wrong with those things in their proper place. But quite frankly, today, while God puts his emphasis on agape, uh, the world puts its emphasis on eros. All right, we are more about that which is uh, erotic, sensual, uh, uh, lustful, uh, that, that longing, and, and where God's love is, is not that type of love. It's deep, it's abiding, it's sacrificial, it's benevolent, it's charitable, and, and we really have, have gotten uh, this whole concept backwards, and our, and our culture has really been blinded to that. And I want to start out this morning by saying that real love is defined by God's truth. Real love has no limits to which it cannot reach. But love does set boundaries. And this is biblical. This is a biblical truth that, that our culture today has taken. And I've seen things that, that love is love. Friend, love is not as you define it. At least as far as eternity is concerned. Love is as God defines it. And that's very important to understand because we have allowed ourselves to be pulled into a concept that, that as long as I define it the way I want it, well, then I have it. That's not true. All right? Um, folks, I, 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 I know I'm touching on some stuff that's very sensitive, but I think it needs to be said because we have allowed uh, the world to dictate definitions to us. And when the world dictates definitions to us, they rewrite the conversation, thereby winning the argument. Please understand the importance of that. Um, there's so many aspects of this that I can look at today, and our culture has lost its mind in some areas, and we have to get back to real love is defined by God's truth. If I ever change that, I'm destroying what love is as far as God is concerned. So real love has no limits, and I'm so thankful for that. The love of God can pursue and reach anyone. Isn't that a wonderful thought? I love the simple fact that God's love can reach to the uttermost, it can reach to the very depths of humanity, and it can save a soul, and it can set him up and put his feet on a solid rock and establish his... I'm so thankful that God's love has no limits, but God's love does set boundaries. And I want to give you a couple examples of that. Christ today is my Savior. He is. But I also want you to understand, in Revelation, Christ is also the final judge. Now, there's going to come a day 
when those who reject Christ will stand in front of God and they will be judged, the Bible says, according to their works. And there's going to be a book opened, which is the book of life. And when their, la- when their name is not found written in the book of life, they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. That's what the Bible teaches. The one who pronounces them guilty is Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ loves. There's no limits to his love. But he does set boundaries. And friend, if a person rejects Christ, Christ as judge will pronounce condemnation. Please understand that. By the way, does he love? Absolutely. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We do have a God that loves us, but we have a God that is holy and that is righteous and his son is always. Does, does, is, is, by the way, is Christ going to love those whom he condemns? Absolutely. The love of God does not stop there, but that love is guided by boundaries of holiness and righteousness. Real love speaks truth, which today sadly has been perceived otherwise. And again, I'll give you an illustration of that, but, but a parent telling a child no, that is wrong, in many cases today is perceived as, not as love, but it's hate. I've watched this within homes, and it's, it's very sad to me as a child who will be told, this is not right for you, this is not good for you, that, that's perceived as hatred. And, and, and parents, we know this. You know why you tell your kids no? Because you love them. You want them to avoid the mistakes you made. Am I correct? Any parents in here who are like, oh boy, I just can't wait for my child to just blow it and wreck their life. That would bring me just great satisfaction. No, there's no parent in here like that today. As parents, we love our kids, and we tell them, no, you can't. I I remember my mother. I remember mom sitting me down. I was probably 16, 17 years old, and and there was a girl that was crushing on me at school, and and I was kind of flattered at that, as any young man is. And and my mother sat me down, and she said, Andy, she is the wrong type of girl for you. I thought my mother hated me. (laughs) Come on, there's a female giving me attention. Mom, you should feed into that. But she warned me, by the way, my mother was right. Let me say it again. My mother was right. All the young people, just see, hear that. She was right. Now, listen to me. Real love speaks truth. That's necessary. Um, Real love is defined by God's truth. Secondly, and I'll say this moving on, real love is a choice. Look with me at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. The Bible says in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and has sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Secondly, this morning, real love is a choice. Real love is a choice. God chose to love us. I want, I want you to understand something here. Real love, see, I love God today. I'm going to be honest. The reason I love God today is because God has done so much for me. I, I, if I don't love God, I'm a fool, all right? I really am. My God has been so good to me. My Savior has been so good to me. But I'll tell you that I did nothing for him. There's no goodness in me. There's nothing I brought to the table that impressed God. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 64 that all of my righteousness is as filthy rags. When I brought my best to God, God said, oh, that's disgusting. That's not flattering to me, but that's the truth. I had nothing to bring to the table, and God chose to reach down and to love me. And listen to me today, all right? You don't fall into love, you, you, as far as God's love is concerned. You fall into that which is erotic. You fall into that which is sensual, but you do not fall into that which is godly. You choose to love them, and that's it. Now, now I want to give you thought here, all right? Um, real love is never dependent on the recipient. Real love is dependent on the giver. Now, that's a wonderful thought, all right? This love over here depends on what you can give to me, and as long as you can give me what I want, I will reciprocate that to some extent. This love over here says, though you can do nothing for me, I choose to love you. 
Now, folks, this is something that's absent in many marriages. It's absent in many homes. It's absent even in our own nation. And I look at this and I wonder, what has happened? Because real love is a choice. People say, well, well, I've just fallen out of love with you. Well, if you fell out of, fell into love with them, that love was not based on the love of God. That love was based on an, on an attraction. And, and don't misunderstand me, all right? Uh, I, the first time I asked my wife out for a date, it wasn't because I knew all about her and knew that I had deep, abiding God love for her. I was attracted to her because she was pretty. You say, well, you're shallow. Well, chalk me up, all right? I don't think any of you said, well, I'm looking for a woman that's homely as, as, as homemade sin because I'm thinking she's got a good personality. <laughs> Is there anybody? I mean, maybe you did. I mean, maybe you're that godly. I don't, but, 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 but I look at, but here's the thing, all right? If at some point I don't choose to love her with the right kind of love, our relationship will fail. And there's a lot of marriages today that are being destroyed because we are saying, what can you do for me rather than what can I do because I've chosen to love you? Hey, moms, before you ever saw that child, you loved it. All right, I've walked into many, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but I've walked into many hospital rooms through the years and a mama has just had a little baby and they're so proud, mom and dad are there and they say, isn't this the world's most beautiful thing? And I'm going to confess a sin to you. I've said yes many times. All right, it's like you. When my, God, when my three children were born, it was like, holy cow. Now I know you say, Pastor, you're terrible. It's the truth, man. I mean, they, they, I'm, I've dug a hole I'm never going to get out of, all right? But I'm telling you what every man thinks, all right? I'm telling you that. And you ladies, they are going to go home, and guys, you're going to do the right thing and say, no, honey, he's crazy. The pastor's crazy. He's, he's out of his mind. He's a terrible person. But ladies, you know this. Before that, ever, that little baby was ever out of the womb, you loved that child. And you know why you loved it? You chose to. You chose to. That little child, and you know this, parents, you know this, there's nothing that child can do that could make you stop loving them. Now, they can break some boundaries, and they cause some friction and cause some problems and break your heart, but you'll never stop loving them because real love is a choice. And listen to me today. We've got to pull that back into our marriages. We've got to pull that back into our homes. We've got to bring in that real love that says, here's the deal. I love you because I've chosen to love you. Now, there's going to be some moments where things are going to get difficult because real love is defined by God's truth. So we're not going to change that, all right? We're not going to alter that, but I will love you no matter what. Real love is a choice. And praise God, real love is not what I can gain, but real love is what I can give. And boy, if we'd understand that, it'd do something for our relationships. Number three, I'd say this. Real love is an action. Real love is an action. Love is to be active. We have, we have lost that. You say, well, well oh, I, I love you because you. No, 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 no. It's supposed to do something, all right? My love, if it's true love, is to do something for others. All right, let, let, let me just use some biblical examples, all right? Uh, 1 John in chapter 4, verse 9, our text today, it says, and this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent, what did God do? He what? Sent his only begotten son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. A Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ do you understand there's action involved? If there's real, true love, it's an active love. Folks, we have a lot of so-called love today that is inactive. And I would challenge you, I really don't believe that's godly love. Because God's love does. It's active. It's moving. It's present. Real love pursues when hurt or disappointed. When we truly love someone properly, the door will be left open, so to speak. It's an active love that says, here's the deal. No matter what happens, I will love you actively. Folks, this is something that God does for us. God pursued us, though we were unworthy. God cares for us today, though we have rejected him or hurt him. And I'm so thankful today that my God loves me today in spite of me. It's an active love. Please just stop for a moment. And folks, again, look at your own marriage. What have you actively done for that husband? What have you actively done for that wife? Kids, what have you actively done because you love your parents? Parents, what have you actively done because you love your children? And, and, and here's the thing, there's many things that are going to come to mind and praise God for that, but I'd ask you recently. 
Because love needs to continue to be active if it's genuine, if it's real, if it's the love of God that abides forever. And so uh, love is an action. I think this is so important to understand because so many times we say, well, 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 pastor, you know, you know, I, I love them. Okay, well, when's the last time you told them? Love is an action, is it not? So when's the last time you spoke it? When's the last time you did something? You say, well, well you know, well, when we were first married, I know, but sir, that was 35 years ago. You sent her flowers 35 years ago, all right? They're dead. You say, but, 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 but she knows how I feel. You have to actively do that. And I will be honest with you, if, if we could get, if we could get the, the older couples to act like the younger couples, we'd solve a lot of our marriage problems, all right? And get the younger couples to act like the older. You see, uh, so oftentimes that, that initial starburst of, 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 of longing and, 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 and desire we let it fade and shame on us. And I said, number one this morning, that love is defined by God's truths. I said, number two this morning, that love is a choice. Real love is a choice. Number three this morning, I said that real love is an action. And number four this morning, I say that real love is of God. Therefore, it is eternal. Look at verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, understand this. The love that God is, is this love. It's an agape love that is deep, it's abiding, all right? It's charitable, it's benevolent, it's sacrificial. That's the love that God is. Therefore, that love is eternal. Love is of God, and God is love. You see, that word eros, lustful, erotic, sensual, that type of love fades over time. <laughs> Come on, folks. You know this to be the case, all right? Uh, John Travolta went from being a heartthrob in, in Greece to being just greased, from fabulous to flabby, all right? It's the truth. Uh, uh, you say, well, Pastor, how come you're ripping on him? He's just convenient, all right? Here, here's the deal. That which is once youthful, is going to fade. I'm 45, all right? I joke sometimes, my hairline is I'm losing the ridges, all right? I'm losing the battle. Things are receding, all right? I am a little heavier than when we got married, all right? If you asked me to fit into the same suit that I was when I got married, I would not be able to breathe, all right? Uh, um, there are things that have changed, all right? My, my knees hurt, my ankles hurt. I'm not, not as youthful, not, 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 I don't have as much energy as I used to in some areas, all right? And so you look at these things and, and those things fade. Youth fades, does it not? All right? By the way, this friendship love, all right, a love that's based on, 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 on what, what is mutual, which I can do for you and you can do for me. As long as you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. As long as you do for me, I'll do for you. And, and again, these are not necessarily wrong, but I need you to understand, see, this type of love will expire when the other side doesn't hold up its end. At some, you ever had somebody that, that maybe you went to college with or you were in the military with or, or, or you've worked with for years and you guys were really good friends, but all of a sudden that, that, that bond that kept you together is gone. And when it's gone, your relationship pretty much ceased. For like three months or six months, you kind of kept in contact and talked a couple of times, but then all of a sudden you find yourself going two, three, five, seven, ten years and you haven't spoken. And once upon a time, you were very good friends. Very good friends. Did, did a lot of things together. Helped each other out through, through a lot of things. But that type of love, when one end side it doesn't hold up the other end, it fails. It fails after being disappointed time after time. And what I want to point out here, folks, is this type of love that is sensual, it has an expiration date. You'll not always be young. Okay? You'll not always look that way. Jim Faulkner has no hair anymore. Boy, Jim, when it, Jim got, if you could see a picture of Jim when he was Marilyn, she's downstairs this morning, but he had the curliest black hair you've ever seen. I mean, Jim was a Don Juan, I'm telling you right now, from Boscobel. He had it going on. But Jim, ever since I've known you, your hair has pretty much been gone. Pretty much. It fades. It fades. Those things go away. And folks, our problem is we base so much on this. As long as it makes my heart go pitter-patter, pitter-patter, pitter hold on a second, all right? That's only going to go on for so long 
on its own. Well, as long as you can do for me, as long as, as you can hold up your end of the deal, hey, come on, let's be honest. Sometimes people aren't going to be able to hold up their end of the deal. Sometimes life is going to happen. Sometimes disease, sometimes problems are going to come in, and, and they're not going to be able to hold up their end of the deal, or you're not going to be able to hold up your side. That is why we have to have a love of God, because true love is eternal. Why? Because it's based on an eternal God. And here's the beautiful thing, and if you'll just give me your attention for a moment, folks, okay, if I have the right kind of love, okay, I love my wife more today than I did when we got married. We've been married 22 and a half years. It's a long time, right? My kids tell me, all right, that's a long time. Uh, I was joking with someone the other day, and I remember being a teenager, and, 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 and somebody in the church turned 40 years old, and I thought, if I ever learned, to, if, I ever, if I ever live long enough to be 40, I hope I die. I remember, think, I, I remember thinking 40 was so old. It's not, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Ken. <laughs> By the way, 60 is looking better all the time. But, but here's the deal, all right? This love will fade over time. It will. Life changes, and those relationships that you had in college or that you had uh, throughout your life working with individuals, those things are going to fade. But if there's a deep, abiding, godly love, it will pull those things along and make them what they ought to be. Yeah. See, my wife is still the world's most attractive woman to me. I love her. She's incredible. She's the mother of my children. She's a wife that cares about me and loves me. And, and here's the deal. I enjoy holding her hand. I enjoy kissing her. I enjoy being with her. There, that, that is a wonderful thing. You say, oh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, that, that's only when, that, I haven't felt that way about my wife in years. That's because you don't have the right kind of love. You see, your love is based on that which makes your heart beat a little extra for a couple moments. It's, it's that which is erotic. It's that which is sensual, but it's a very shallow kind of love. And, and we know this, and we see this, and, and, and adults, we kind of laugh at it sometimes. We see the, you know, some of these young couples, and they're just so excited. And it's a wonderful thing, and it really is, and I'm not trying to downplay that at all. But, but, but please understand something. Without God's love, based on God's truth, this love will fail. This love will disappoint you. At some point, you're going to look and, and, and you're going to say you're, you're different than you used to be or, or you aren't. It isn't, it, I don't feel the same way. That's true. Come on, folks. Life does things to us. I'm not talking about adding a few pounds, but life brings with it some difficulties and, and it brings with it some hardships and we go through some, some struggles together and it has a way of, of changing us a little bit. You say, well, I just, I just don't feel the same way about you like I used to. And friend, this morning, this is where... And, and I, this, folks, I, I want you to take what I'm talking about today and apply it to where you are today. Please, no, don't, 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 don't any of you go back 10 years and say, well, I wish I had. You can't. Okay, I'm talking about today. But please understand, okay, this down here in its proper place, it's okay if this is in its proper place. But if that is, see, that, that's why we have all the problems with all the, the fornication and adultery and illicit relationships because we are basing our concept of love right here. As long as it makes me feel good in the moment, I'm going to do it. No, 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 no. All right? Uh, that which is truth says, hey, 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 no, no, you wait. You wait. Hey, you, you wait to be with her. You wait to kiss her until that day that the, the preacher says, kiss the bride. You see, that's when you're saying to her, hey, God's truths to me are more important than my feelings in this given moment. And folks, we have to get back to that. And today in your marriage, you need to stop basing on, well, well, she makes me feel good. If she doesn't make you feel good, sir, that makes no difference. Because your love for her is to be based on that which is of God. And God's love is eternal. This morning, real love is defined by God. Real love is defined by God. We have people in our culture today saying, well, love is love. That's not true. I don't get to define that. He did. God defined love. God defined what it is. God defined what it is not. Secondly, real love is a choice. Real love is a choice. And I'm not talking about this fickle thing where we fall in it and fall out of it. I'm talking about this real thing where I say, here's the thing. If I have chosen to love you, I will always love you. Real love is a choice. By the way, that's what God did for us. 
He looked at us and said, I love you. He didn't say, I love you because of what you bring to the table. He said, I love you because I choose to. That's a wonderful type of love. It doesn't depend on the giver, or on the, I'm sorry, on the recipient. It depends on the giver. Real love, it's an action. If we love, we will do. Okay, and, and the, by the way, there's so many scripture verses I could have pulled out today. If I love, I will do. Just love is an action. If your love is not active, your love is not real. And then lastly, real love is based on God or is of God. Therefore, it is eternal. Let's go and stand to our feet. Friend, this morning I've spoke to you about some things that, again, I really hope will be a help to you. And I know I've talked about marriage uh, by and large, but there's, there's an aspect of this that has nothing to do with marriage. This is a type of love that we are to offer all men. If you look at 1 John chapter 4, it's not talking about marriage. It's talking about my love for my brother. And today we need to have a love that says, hey, here's the thing. I'm going to love you not because of you, but quite frankly, in spite of you. Because I choose to. Because that's how God defined his love to me. Not that I loved him, but that he first loved me. And I'm going to choose to love my brother. Friend, what a difference that would make, hey, in your family, in this church, folks, in this community, in this world, if the love of God would be shed abroad in our hearts and in our lives. See, Jesus Christ changed the world not because he was a radical, dynamic leader. He changed the world because he loved us. And he gave himself for us. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that ye love one another. And Christian, today, as you sit there and say, oh, this, this, it's about marriage today, it's about marriage. Yeah, there's been a lot about marriage, but I want you to stop and consider this. It's about how you treat the person next to you. It is. And I need you to stop and consider love is a choice. Love is a choice. Love is an action. You say, well, well I'm not married. I don't need to. No, no, you ought to be actively being gracious, benevolent, charitable to people in your life, yeah. sacrificing for others. Love is an action. And friend, love is eternal. I'm so thankful for that because what happens is when we put God's love in its proper place, it pulls those other loves that are involved where they ought to be. And it makes love pure and holy and just and good. Today, come on, let's be honest. Our young people, my kids are growing up in a world where love is almost a dirty thing. And that's sad to me. I hate that. But the love of God is holy and pure. And if we'll put it where it belongs, it'll help us to be the people that we ought to be. In a moment, we're going to have the piano and the organ play. And friend, if the Lord's laid something in your heart, I'd encourage you to come to the altar and take it up with him. And friend, if you're here today, I want you to know that God loves you. He sent his son for you. Christ died for you. We have a big God, and he offers all of us salvation. Aren't you glad God's love has no limits? It can reach to the uttermost. The worst sinners among us can be saved and are saved when they trust Jesus as their Savior. And friend, if you're here today and without Christ, you don't have to leave without him. And friend here, listen to me. What type of love today are you displaying in your life? Is it erotic? Is it sensual? That which is lustful and longing? Is it that which as long as somebody can, you know, you know as long as you hold up your end of the deal, as long as, you know, as long as you, as long as you take care of your side, I'll, I'll do mine, and that's good. We, we can get along. That's a good relationship, and boy, I like that, and that's good. Or do you have a love that's sacrificial, that's benevolent, that's charitable, that would make God proud because it is what God is? I pray that today you've just taken some some time, thought. As you just begin to play, if the Lord's laid something on your heart, you come to the altar.
Well, folks, thank you so much for being in the service this morning. I appreciate each and every one of you uh, coming out and being a part. And uh, there's so much in that passage. Go home and read that a little bit. There's so much more truth to be dug out of there, and I feel so inadequate when it comes to something like this. But that love of God, the love of God is what will change. It will change us. It will change our marriage. It will change our home. It will change our culture. And we've got to pull it back in. What we do we must, must be done with charity, with love, and that is God's. So let's go ahead and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Uh, Sharon Rhinus, before I dismiss with prayer, um, expressed a desire to join the church. And so Sharon, where you want, can I have you come up here and after the service I'll have folks come by and, and shake her hand. But Sharon uh, shared with us, uh, Jim and I, her testimony last week. She got saved last July, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right in saying that, Sharon? And right here, Sharon, right by John, there you go, good, perfect, all right, and uh, trusted Christ as her Savior, and then she got baptized a couple months after that, boy, we're so proud of Sharon, she's been a wonderful blessing, and I'm very thankful for her, but she would expressed a desire to join the church, and so I figured if they let me in, we have to let Sharon in, so praise God, and uh, she's a blessing, she really is, but let's be dismissed with a word.